Thank you for joining us on our journey here to preserve the history of mixed martial arts. When I wanted to take on this project, I needed help. I brought in one of my favorite matchmakers, Miguel Iterate, and the MMA detective, Mike Davis. So to do this, we've been able to preserve history. Welcome and enjoy. Hey, Miguel Iterate here, Lights Out Podcast. That's the MMA detective, Mike Davis, and we're back. Another deep dive interview. We have Chris Lytle waiting in the wings. And uh, we are going to see uh, about Seth Bagzinski, another Southwestern fighter, Mike, another guy with a lot of fights and um, some interesting stories from a deep hole there in the Rage in the Cage uh, promotion. So uh, what do you got? Okay, so Rage in the Cage is kind of like if you were to compare it to something. One, they've got a ton of shows. He's probably got like four or 500 shows under his belt. and you got to look at it kind of like, like if you were to compare it to a car, it's kind of like the Fred Flintstone mobile with his feet underneath it, just kind of making the car move. And the stories from there that I have heard, you know, just, you know, from the independent grind are pretty shocking. So I know we're going to talk about cage rage. We're going to talk about his relate, you know, Seth's relationship with Drew Fickett, as well as like, we're also dealing with a person we're dealing with a person whose sister was murdered and his brother is doing life in prison. And like, if you look at his trajectory, like from childhood as to where he's at right now, he's, he's not supposed to, he's not supposed to be on either on this side of the grass or this side of the bars. So it's somebody that absolutely mixed martial arts has saved his life. And he seems like a real, like the, the few interviews I've seen of him, he seems like a very honest guy. And um, I, th- I think we're, I think we're going to have a guy that brings his lunch to work and he's going to, he's going to tell us kind of from his view, his point of view, you know, what he experienced. I think it's going to be pretty good. The Polish Pistola. Mike, where are you going to be this month? Next well, month? here I got uh, December 3rd and 4th. I'm at the Canterbury Expo Center in Minnesota. December 17th, I am in Chicago, um, 115 Bourbon Street, doing color commentary. And T- Tampa, Florida, Smooth Comp, please register for a jiu-jitsu tournament, um, February 5th. And with that, I am done. Please like, share, subscribe. We've got an affiliate now. We have affiliate code lights out at Diamond Sportsbook. It's betdsi.eu. If you like to gamble on a fight, they give you 50% cash bonus for your first deposit using our, um, you know, using our promo code lights out and, um, and please, please, please guys like share, subscribe. We're growing. We see it. We're going to break into that top 50 in terms of MMA podcasts very soon. As long as you guys, uh, you know, keep pushing our product and it's, it's greatly appreciated. And here we go with. The Polish Pistola. Hey, Miguel Adorati, back here with the Lights Out Podcast. We got Chris Lytle on a run today. So uh, we're going to get this started with the MMA detective, Mike Davis, and our deep dive guest, Seth Bagzinski, UFC veteran, uh, out of the very rugged Southwest scene, uh, you know, Arizona, New Mexico, that area and stuff. And uh, we're going to get into it with Seth. Mike, what you got? And Seth, hello. What's up, y'all? All All right. So the Arizona scene, it's so so wide in regards to, like, MMA history. It's wide and thick and incredibly deep. But it all centers around, um, you know, Rage in the Cage. And there's so many little hidden gems of stories from that area. And the only person we've, well, we've gotten two people out of there. We've got obviously Joe Riggs and we did Drew Fickett about a month ago. And Drew called me up the next day and he said, Seth Bagzinski is your next interview. Like he was like, like an order he was giving me. <laughs> and uh, yeah, he, said, he waits for you to say like, yes, sir. Yeah. You know? yeah, or, <laughs> yeah. Or karate. I think you're supposed to respond with karate sometimes. That's like, yes. And Drew Fickett lingo. So we got the Polish pistol up. And the thing with Seth is when you, I, I'm not trying to start too heavy on this interview, although it's going to get there. If you look at Seth's background, it, it is literally, 
I hope you've never heard of him because it's such a fascinating story. And if it's your first time hearing it, fantastic. But I truly believe mixed martial arts probably saved your life, Seth. Would you would you agree with that based on your upbringing? I mean, I I, I don't think about it all the time because I'm so busy with life. And I, I think a little bit is designed, even if I if subconsciously I do it. But every now and then someone asks me a question about like, you know, I'll see somebody from where I grew up or a teacher or something. I saw this, uh, my old teacher, Miss Loftus, and they, they always just sent me the resource because I was so dang crazy. I was such a problem. Teachers did not get paid enough to deal with me. And this, she was a beautiful person. Um, she, her name's Tanya Loftus, and I saw her at a game. And she said, hey, Seth, you know, I've been following your career. And I was like, what's up, bro? And she was like, did you ever think that you would go all the places and do all the things you did, you've done? Did you ever really think that something like that would happen? I was like, well, I was always pretty confident that if I put the work in whatever I did, I, I, I could hit the outcome I'm looking for. And she's like, well, you're always very dedicated. And she's like, you know, I've been a teacher for 35 something years. She's like, I'm a, I'm a principal and, and this job's never taken me anywhere. And I was like, holy smokes, man. Like the, the, she's given her life to that. And then here's this, here's this mongoloid just gets to, just get, get to go do it, you know? And, and it, it really like on the way home, I was really like, like taken back by it and just thinking like, man, like, you know, uh, how lucky I am. And every now and then someone will say something where it's just like, I, you don't think about it because you're in life. But when you say it and you're, you're on your ride home and the radio is off and you're kind of thinking like, dang, man, like, how the hell did I end up here? And to some people, they would look at my life and just think it's a life. But it's hard for me to really articulate um, where I came from and who I who I was always told I was going to be versus who I am. And uh, I bet you it's a stark difference between those two. Right. Cause I mean, I was, I remember vividly being places and, and being in front of stores and like the way people would look at us. We were always the poorest people in every town we went to, you know, uh, relatively close, but what my mom and dad were good people, you know, like, I like to say that they were there were two people that were treading in water and they could barely stay afloat in the middle of the ocean and someone gave them five kids, you know, like they, it was hard. It's hard. Yeah. It's hard for some people to get to this life, you know, and everyone has different battles. And I just remember looking at people like, why are you guys looking at me like that? I would be looking around like, who are y'all looking at? <laughs> you know, and then when I realized they're looking at me, I was just like, what, you know, I'm just trying to get to my day or whatever. And you I think you ever, guys were probably a rough house too, though. Like, my brother's a sociopath, man. When I tell people my bro, my my babysitter was a sociopath, they laugh. They're like, "You're funny," but I'm I'm not joking. <laughs> like, you know, like he's crazy. You know, he's crazy. So, you know? your brother, who you just mentioned, he, I think he's is he doing time? Oh, yeah. currently, yeah, yeah. How, how long has he been locked up? I mean, he's been locked up more than half his life. He's he's five years older than me okay so he's just um, kind of in and out so i mean and, and we'll, 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 we're gonna obviously yeah. circle back but imagine if mixed martial arts was subtracted like all that time that you spent in the gym or friday and saturday night at a fight whether you were fighting or not fighting if you made that free time you'd be sitting next to your brother right now i think it's fairly safe to say bro it's it's insane um, and I don't like, bro, I'm so, all, all the time I'll be driving, I'll, I'll like look at a sunset or something and just be like, you know, fuck, like so many people don't get to see, so many people I know don't, don't get to see that. And it's crazy. Like, um, I, I, I remember I, I had a real hard time getting out of high school when I, when I got out, cause I always wanted to play pro football. And I felt I was probably better in my mind than I really was, <clears throat> but I felt that was pretty good. And I remember about half, I don't know, it was probably about 12th grade. I had this coach, Dan Ridgeway, 
or not 12th of my junior year. So he was my coach all four years. He was one of my, he was like, he moved up with us in high school. He's a real cool dude. His mom was, in, his wife was in the school and he was leaving to go to another school. And I was pissed. Like when I find out I was pissed, cause he was like, he was like a, a big mentor. And when I, um, <clears throat> sorry. And I don't think you throat. listen to many people either. Do you know what I mean? I think you're a type of guy that you need to have respect for somebody in order to truly listen to them because you're, you're you know, we're, we're all hard headed here, you know, like you need an example, like a, a no, like yeah, somebody. Yeah, Would you agree with that? Yeah. He, he, he was just like, um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. He, he was just someone that always took the time, you know, he always took the time to, to let me know, like, like, hey, well, it was always about adjustments. That's, that's, that's one thing my dad, even though he was always working all the time, you know, he, he, would, he would always tell me, like, no matter what, it was never like, you can't do this, or maybe you should do this, it was like that. And I remember he was leaving, um, and he got a job in St. Louis, and I, it was already common knowledge to a lot of my teachers that I, I pretty much lived on my own. Like my dad had already moved out, my mom was moved out. I just pretty much like I had a spot, but they kept the electric electricity and the water on, you know. And it, it was very important for me to graduate high school, and I was so scared to have people find out that I I, I didn't have parents because I just the worst for whatever reason, I was just so scared about going into CPS. Like that, like having my whole plan, life replanted. And I remember, you know, like, like feeling real sorry for myself. Uh, some days, like I, I would, you know, on the weekends, if, if I wasn't hanging out with my buddies in town or something, I would, uh, you know, I would get, I'd get real, real down on myself. And, and I remember just, just vividly, like, I don't know, it's like 16. I was like, you know, I'm going to graduate and I'm going to do something. And when, when coach Ridgeway was leaving, I was like, everyone else was like, congratulations. And I was like, yeah, you're a bitch. <laughs> and he was like, uh, he was like, uh, you know, he just started smiling and laughing, but he ended up asking me to, to move in with him my senior year. And, and I, I didn't do it. You know, I was just scared to leave where I was from. And I was so close to graduating but maybe a little you know, embarrassed too, you know, no, I, I, I was just fucking always on my own and, and I was kind of used to it. And I was just so scared to leave what I knew. Who knows what it would have brought, you know, he's like, okay, we'll study real hard. We'll get all your grades. If you want to play college ball, I can get you into it. And I didn't do it. So then when I got out of school, I was, I remember wanting to grow up so bad when you're a kid, you know, when you're a kid, you want to grow up so bad and, then you grow up and you're like, what the fuck? This is what I wanted to grow up for, to, to, <laughs> to go to RTO Sullivan's and and drink beer and everyone to talk shit about each other behind their back. And it's just like the, 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 the whole adult scene just was like uh, very unfulfilling to me. And I was just looking for something. And then, then when I found MMA, it was like, I didn't give a fuck about any of anything else. Like, I didn't care. Like once I fought, I got my ass kicked. I had no idea what I was doing, you know, and I couldn't wait to do it again. Like, I was just like, I don't know what the fuck that was. Like, I never felt like that in my life. I was so nervous and scared. And I remember looking up in the arena. Well, um, here, let's, let, let's frame yeah. it properly. So your first fight, Sorry. April 6, 2005, Rage in a Cage, a renowned promoter Roland Saria I'm sure he's one of your favorite people we'll get to that in a minute I'm sure you fight Ryan Potter now who were you training with prior to this bout taking place nobody <laughs> I uh I had never I, I, I played basketball football ran track I always told all my friends that wrestled two of my best friends were some of the best wrestlers ever went to uh our school in in Arizona too and I used to tell them when they'd be like, why don't you wrestle, dog? I'd be like, cuz I, I I play real sports. Like I can I can make the basketball team. You know what I'm saying? Like, 
y'all can't <laughs> y'all can't play any other sport, all right? Um, and I, I was cornering my buddy Little B. He's he's like four eleven, and he he's he's the definition of all heart. You know when you see oh he's all heart like that's just yeah. my guy right? That's my guy. I I hear him talking in a in Arteo Sullivan's actually. I hear him yipping down the hallway to the security guards. He's like, yeah, I'm gonna give him a fake and give him the little B special. He's drunk, telling all the bouncers how he's gonna knock this dude out. I'm like, man. <laughs> So he was it's drinking Thursday. that night that he yeah, fought. Yeah, Thursday and he's fighting Saturday. Okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I'm right. funny time. Time. <laughs> okay. I'm like, hey, dog, what are you doing, man? And he's like, you still got Friday to drink, Mike. Come on. Yeah, he's like, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get down, Seth. I'm gonna get this to the little B special. And I'm like, you're going home. Like, come on. And I was like, dog, have you looked at the guy you're fighting at all? And he's like, yep. And I was like, have you trained any kickboxing at all? And he goes, nope. I go, you know, he's a pretty good kickboxer, right? Like, how are you going to close a distance? It was just like, I didn't know anything about fighting. He's yet, talking but... common sense. This is shop. Yeah, yeah just like shop talk. How, how the fuck, how the fuck is your vertically challenged ass going to get inside without getting kicked inside the head pretty much? <laughs> like, you know, and, and, he, and he goes, hey, we, can you corner me? I'm like, you don't even got nobody to corner you? Like, like this is even I'll, getting I'll, worse. Yeah. Yeah, I went down. I'll, I'll go down the corner room and he he gets annihilated pretty he, <laughs> he almost got him though man he just came up a little short you know he, <laughs> he missed him and he side he just head kicked him dropped him he gets back up head kicks him again i go in there bro he's he's like hey what happened i said or he goes how'd i look i said not very good he goes all right <laughs> didn't, give a, didn't give a rip you know he was just doing it to have fun and the, I saw Ro, as the first time I met Roland Sarah. He goes, "Hey, you're ready to fight." I said, "I am." I I, I didn't know what night? it was. I was just like, "Let's see what's up, man." And I was this like, the same night. It was it was like two weeks later or something. So Roland Saria had almost he would throw sometimes events on a Friday and then in a different city on a Saturday. Like he he would I, I he has had months where he's done ten different mixed martial art events. He's like a you. He's like a used car salesman, but he's selling fighters. Yeah. Okay. Fans, so here, bring us through. But in a circus tent. Okay. <laughs> you know, I, he's you trying know? not to step out of a clown car. You know, that's 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 your main yeah. goal. Yeah. So your first fight, Ryan Potter, you lose by rear naked choke. Smashed. He just beat my ass. <laughs> okay. And well, what are you weighing at this point? Like, I, like, I was, like. Because a football I was, player, you probably like, blown up. No, nah, yeah, I was, I was getting pretty fat there That's great. for a little bit, but I, but I was trying to play pro football, so I was like two fifteen, and then I started working out real hard, getting in shape. And I was just kind of around my natural rate. I was like one ninety eight, like one ninety six ish, you know. Okay. Um, and and I, he he wrestled a little bit too. Like I think he was a one eighty four champ okay. or, or, or runner up or something. Oh. Pretty good. Oh, and, 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 and I had no, I like, I didn't know anything about MMA, you know, nothing. And I didn't know that back then they had open hand punches on the ground, which is good for someone like me looking back. I'm like, man, how come I can't punch people in the face? And now looking back that I didn't know anything, I'm glad nobody can elbow me and punch me until I learned a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> that helps. So your, your first fight, you said you've got an incredible, almost euphoric rush after the bout. It was, I mean, I've never been scared to fight. Like, we fought our whole lives growing up. Like, I don't, I, when I, I put it this way, when I was a kid, I fought so much that I stopped telling people when I get in fights because they didn't believe me. Like, we fought every weekend. Like, every weekend, if we went to a different town and there was girls there, priority. Number one, girls. Usually it didn't work out because we're all idiots. Yeah. Priority number two was we got to beat some dudes up in front of these girls. <laughs> like, <laughs> and, and like it didn't go like that in your head, but like if there's dudes from another town, we were all giving them dirty looks. And we're like, what's up, dog? What are you looking at? Like, you know, what are you doing here? And they're like, this is our town. Like, no, it's not. Like we were idiots. We fought everywhere. If we would fight 
if there was no if there's no girls no dudes from other towns we'd fight each other that's how stupid we were yeah, we're just you know I, I just don't i don't think we like as men catch up to women maturity wise probably to about our 30s and especially then there's a huge difference there's a vast difference in maturity yeah i could still hang out with my kids all day like I'm hanging out with my friends. I can I can I can watch Lion King. <laughs> I, you know, I, right. I'm still a kid. You know what I'm saying? All right. So August cool. August sixth is your first fight. Your second fight doesn't go well. You lose very naked choke in the first round to Ryan Potter, obviously a very advanced high school wrestler. Um, and your second fight is actually about that was supposed to take place a few weeks prior, but it was canceled. And it's against Robert King. You pick up your yep. first win. Yep, I, I open hand slapped him because uh, we were open hand. So I gave him the old Nick Diaz. I gave him the stock and slap back in the day. Good. And uh, he was getting kind of shocked him, you know. And there was a lot of people there too. Like that was at Jobbing.com Arena, which is now Gila, Gila River. So like Roland used to give out two for one. So like it was a big crowd, you know, because back in the day when we would fight, like when I fought at Wild Bills, there's like, you know, three boxing commission members <laughs> like there, you know, there some of these crazy places you fight. There's not very many people there, but that was a, that was a pretty big arena. Um, that worked out quick. And I actually trained with that. That guy came up and trained a few times. He was just an older cat, just looking to have a good time. And I got lucky, got a win. So you're not serious about it yet. I mean, you're only like a month and a half then. I didn't even know what it was. I knew I wanted to do it, but I had no idea how I was going to make it happen. So and, you know, what was what was Roland paying you at this time for for showing up with with fights like this? Nothing. We but but it was like uh, the for the the those were amateur fights, so I wasn't planning on getting paid. You know, like um, I kind of knew that much. I knew that I knew All that right. there's like a lot of, a lot of gymnastics and there's a lot of like skaters and shit that that pay to get in competitions don't make money for a while you know so i i kind of understood that part of it but it was so new there was no blueprint like nobody knew nothing about mma you know yeah. like there was no you if you do this this is going to happen like um i no i mean well let, nobody let me knew ask shit let me ask you, because so all of a sudden, you know, you're an athlete, you're coming out, you know, you're a football player, you're a basketball player, you're confident in your athleticism. Sure, you'll fight, you get into a fight, you lose one, you win one. But Roland, Roland Saria, now that shows like on RITC 80. So there are people hanging around, like who's the first guy who came up to you and said, hey, why don't you come work with us? He had to. You know, it, it was... um. You guys, you guys, there's a guy named Gilbert Aldana. Okay. Um, and he was training there, and I liked him. This guy, Dave Connett, uh, who's good friends with Roland. I'll probably get a call from him because I talk sh a lot of shit about Roland, but that's, I'll talk shit in front of Roland. Um, he, you know, he was there, and we were training, and he, he was getting ready to fight in the UFC, I think. And we were pretty good friends. And I was, I was always a tweener, you know, I'm six foot three. So I'm like, I'm not real small, but I'm not real big. So I was training with Gilbert Aldana. And then I was, he had this boxing coach, Joe Leva. He was from um, Tijuana. He went to Maryville High School. He's kind of rough dude, but he really liked me. And for whatever reason, he saw something in me. And, and he told me like, Hey, he's called me Sefi. He's like, Sefi, let's uh, every, every Tuesday and Thursday, you know, let me know what times you can make it. And and I worked all day and I trained at night with the team. He wanted extra work, just doing bag work because he had some boxing. So he came in every Tuesday and Thursday. I couldn't pay him for a while anyways. And uh, he showed up every Tuesday and Thursday. I would work out an hour at the gym, 6.30 in the morning before I went to work. We'd do bag work and he'd put me through uh, shadow boxing drills and just get me better. And I ended up being just kind of like a partner for him and and getting Gilbert ready, you know? And he was just always telling me, like, hey, Seth, you, man, you got a lot of potential. Like, you know, he would, he would always just kind of instill that little bug in me. And, and it, it, it wasn't really until, like, after Gilbert passed away tragically. And uh, he was at the lake, and, and I had a horrific accident and drowned. And 
It's kind of a reoccurring that. theme in your life, man. You've, you've lost a lot of people and I'm, I'm scared to make friends sometimes. <laughs> you, you know, truth be told, truth be told, man, you absolutely without fighting are on the short list of, of something like that taking place to yourself as well. Yeah. I, like I said, man, I, I, I'm thankful for every day I have. I'm thankful for the life I have every day. I, I, I stop at, I try to, have a little reset even if it's for 15 seconds every day and just appreciate what i got that's awesome that's awesome so from there um man shane johnson okay roland seria is not doing you any favors with this fight um no. you're one and two and you fight the battle cat shane johnson and he lands i mean for somebody that's completely untrained he lands a knee bar against you which I mean, it's, it's, it's got the recipe for absolute disaster of walking forever with a limp. <laughs> Listen, I knew so little. And, I, and, and he told me it's two weeks notice. But in my mind, it, 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 at, when you're 20 something years old and you're, living for, and you're living for the weekend, you know, my whole life, like where I'm from, it's like Daytona 500. There's mobile homes everywhere in the parking lot getting down. Like it's for the weekend. Like you live one weekend at a time. And when he said two weeks, I'm like, oh, shoot, we got plenty of time, you know? He said he'd help me train. And every day I went in there early and tried to train with him. He never really helped me. It was just like the, the class or whatever. And, you know, when I, when I took that fight, it was just the fight. You know, I, I didn't give it. I didn't care. I really didn't. It wasn't like, it's like, all right, well, let's go see what's up. And then slowly, like every one of those fights, I'm like, all right, man, like you really, you really need to, if you're going to keep doing this, like, you really got to figure something out. Like, this is not going to cut it. You're never going to get better here. Because I showed up every day. I'd stay after I'd run. Like, I did my thing, you know. Like, I tried to work with what I had. And 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 I always did extra. Like, I hung a, I hung a punch a bag in my yard. I didn't know how to punch, but I was working on it. You was, had the I, outdoor I, dude, gym? I, bro, I tried everything. Like, I, awesome. I always been like that, you know. Like, when I was a kid. I play, I like playing basketball. I'd shoot 500 baskets a day. You know, like I just always, I always, that was, that was my way to get away. Like that, that's what I did. You know, every, every day, every day I could have the shittiest day or go home. And, and, and if I worked out, it was, it was all good. So like, that's just kind of how I didn't realize it was a coping mechanism at the time, but that's what it was like sports. And so that's what I did. Well, let, let's talk about your record as well. Like you're saying these are amateur fights, but they're on your professional record. Roland keeps going back and getting them put on there. I, I'm certain it's him. Because I've had him taken off multiple times. Uh, okay, man. Why Listen, is he doing that? When I, the, the, when I was in the UFC, I was like 12 and you 5, have, I think. Like 12 you, you, and 5 when I got in. Yeah. And they were off my record the whole time, but we had like call shirt August here, like, look, these are amateur fights, you know? And they took them off. And then I started getting some calls from other places, you know, cause I didn't have a real bad record when you took a lot of those amateur fights off. At that time I had, I had a, a, a you know, a winning record and a lot of finishes. And he was like, and then when I got out of UFC this last time, I had a torn ACL. I was out for a while and I was talking to Ray Steffo about going to pro fight league. And at the end of the day, I ended up getting, they ended up calling me at the end of it and saying, you know, you had, you had, it was your record, you know? And I was like, huh? My record? Man, yeah, fool, you know, like thinking, fool, you know what my record is. And then I was like, hey, dog, it's all good. Like, I, I understand that's a shitty job to have to call people and tell them they can't, that they're not getting picked to do their dreams. So I said, hey, guys. That's all good, man. Don't sweat it. And then for some reason, I was like, my record shit. I couldn't even remember what my record was. So I went and looked it up and I was like, oh shit, he had all those put on there again. And, yeah, he put all these amateur fights and they're clearly, I mean, they're obviously amateur just looking at the surface level. Three minute but, rounds. But let, let's talk about what I believe is your first professional fight with him. Miguel, this, this is fantastic. Rage in a Cage, March 18th, 2006. You fight a 265-pound Jonathan Tusi. <laughs> yeah. The native pit bull. Yeah, he's cool, too. <laughs> hey, he told me he was around my size. 
You're talking about Roland, he's the a, promoter. Yeah, Roland. He goes, and he's this is my coach. So like this is one of the lessons where I was like, all right, well. So Roland is your coach at this period. Kinda. Like he we I go to his gym. Okay. You know, fair enough. I go to his gym. And I, you know, I, I'm I'm coming from a place where it's like, yo, we're all a team, you know what I'm saying? Like, why why would this dude bull, bullshit me? So I mean, my, my sister's there, all my, and this is in um, uh, Fort McDowell Casino, I believe. Yeah. It's, cl- it's close to, it's close to my hometown, the closest. So I had a lot of people there and I'm like, shit, man. Like he had, John Tossi came up, there was him and this other dude. And I thought it was the other dude because he's about my size. Then when they said, when they were, they told me to get on the scale, I'm like, I'm fighting that guy. He's like, oh yeah, yeah, you, you got that. And I'm like, I was you know, I it's like an hour, two, it. an hour or two from fight time. And I'm like, all right, whatever. So I, I'm just going to, I work too hard to just not fight now. I got too many people here. What did you weigh in how at? he would do it, you know? He would, he would get you committed and, and, and then, and then kind of like manipulate you with that, with that commitment, you know? What was the weight difference between you two? He was every bit of 265. I was 186 pounds. <laughs> You're talking like almost a 90 pound weight difference. Okay. Well, the good news is that you, uh, I think you won, you choked him out. Yep. Not an easy, I mean, the crowd must have went nuts when you see like two, <laughs> a, a size yeah. difference between two opponents like that. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it was pretty, he, 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 he hit me with something too early too, because I, I had no defense. I, I still don't, but he hit me with something early. And it was like, it was like 30 degrees. It was like in December. I remember it being so dang cold, warming up. I'd warm up and I'd have to warm up again, warm up again. And I remember going out there and I, I remember putting my hands on the, the, the cage and thinking, oh, this cage is going to hurt so fucking bad when I get scraped up against it because it's cold, you know? <laughs> I remember thinking that, like, oh, this cage is going to hurt so fucking bad. Like when you hit your hand on something when it's cold, I was like, no. And it, it went, it went good, but I, I remember that was, that was kind of the, the point where I was like, man, I got to start looking for another place to train, but there was no avenues really, you know, like there, there was. Well, what'd you get paid for that fight? $35. <laughs> 35 total? So he paid me 500 for fighting Shane Battlecat, right? Okay. So I thought, Hey, he's like, you want to fight again? And I'm fighting that fucking light heavyweight is what he told me. And. I'm thinking I'm getting another five. I didn't even think to question it because like he's he's my guy, right? Yeah. He gives me a check for $35. Joe Riggs is in there. Edwin Deweese. I didn't know none of these guys. But Dan Luz- uh, Lauzon is on the undercard too. Yeah, there was there was like a bunch of fucking G's in this room. And and I go, hey dog, I think you fucked up on my check. It's only for it's missing $35. A zero. Yeah. And it's, it, it says like uh Warrior Cage Fighting LLC or something like that. And he goes, huh? And I showed it to him. He goes, who the fuck do you think you are, Chuck Liddell? And hands it back to me. And I'm just like, I was in shock. Don't overreact. Don't overreact. That's what I kept saying to myself. Like, don't, don't fucking overreact. And I was like, I, I was like, all right, like, I see what this is now. You know, that was like the moment where I'm like, all right. Yeah, you're not on my team. You're on your team, and and uh, I'm glad to know that now. Okay, you know? so so did you meet Drew Fickett that night? Because him and Lausanne are real close. No, uh, I I ended up start. I started bouncing around, like looking for a place to train, and I had nothing against ACS. I had never gone there, but. You talking about Arizona the, Combat Sports, the Lally brothers. Yeah, yeah. The 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 Joe Riggs, Joe Riggs used to call him Pex from uh Willow. <laughs> you like you little Pex. <laughs> I always thought that was so freaking funny, dude. He's hilarious. And uh yeah, I I I didn't have anything against him. I didn't know him, but I, I just kind of wanted to get a place where I could have somebody because I, I knew enough that I had a lot of building to do. You know, I had no wrestling and, and it wasn't like, I'm not going to go ask a D one guy that's getting his career ready to drill uh, grade school wrestling shit with me. Cause 
it's hard enough just training yourself, you know? Mm -hmm. So I found Southwest MMA and Santino DeFranco and Rich Moss had opened this little gym over there and it was a little bit smaller and I knew I needed some one-on-one -on -one time, like on the little odd nuances and, and kind of even like a theory, like I didn't even really have an idea how I wanted to fight. I know I wanted to stand up. I know that was a, a I wanted to be an exciting fighter. And I found that gym and that's how I met Drew Ficker. That's cool. That's cool. So you go from uh, 2C where you win by choke and you continue to fight for rage in a cage where you start racking up wins. You, you hit Travis DeGrout with a Kimura first round. That's, that's the first that he was drew was his coach. Really? They went like nine and one or something. And Travis beat, like he beat the piss out of me. I let him hit me until he got tired. And I choked, <laughs> I choked that. <laughs> like, that didn't really, I was, he was a really good wrestler. Like zero wrestling, like a wind would, blow and I would fall over you know like and Drew was in his corner they had Efren Escondero was on that card they had a bunch of really good guys and they had a, a gangster little team I remember I didn't know him or nothing and I was kind of just fucking with Travis because I mean like I ain't talking shit to be dis disrespectful but just like fucking little goon games you know and I was like hey dog we we're staying out getting ready to go out and I go hey uh winner buys a beer I told him and he looked at me like, what? Uh, winner buys. Like, whoever wins buys a beer. He goes, okay. And then I beat him. And like two years later or something, I seen him somewhere. He goes, hey, you owe me a beer, fool. I'm like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're right. <laughs> you know? But, but Drew knew Santino from ACS. They're both trained at ACS. And uh, when Drew came, came back, like he – he came back from Oregon or something and he was looking for a place to train. He got booted out of ACS already. You know, Drew's been kicked out of nicer places than this. Dude, Drew has been yeah. kicked out. <laughs> I, I, Miguel, tell him about Abu. We were at ADC's Abu Dhabi in uh, Trenton, New Jersey, and Drew got sent home early. And we, we talked about it in the interview with him. Dude, that guy's a madman. He's a madman. He's a savant. He's a genius. But Absolutely. But I, bro, for, I mean, I don't know, for 10 years I knew him. I had no idea when he was joking. And then I realized one day that he's always joking. Mm -hmm. He just doesn't laugh. Like, you don't know. Like, he looked dead straight at you and be like, you know, say something funny and walk off. And you're like, and he'll always wear his headphones. He'll go into, he'll go into places where he had headphones, but he, he never has them on just so people don't talk to him. <laughs> he's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's my guy, you know? Now, you, you, obviously, Drew's unique, right? But how do you feel at this point? Because, you know, you, you go from kind of training, you know, on the side and then training. Yeah, you're the B side. The, and then training with the promoter, which, you know, doesn't work out well for you. And now, you know, whether you like it or not, you know, the, the lollies Man. have a real good level. You know, the... Uh, uh, and Santino DeFranco, you, you can see where he is now. Drew Fickett, you're starting now. You're around real, real, real people. How how'd you fit in? How'd that work out? Well, I I knew I knew I was always dedicated, you know, because um, I'd tell my homies like, yeah, I want to fight in the UFC, and they would like that. Some Napoleon Dynamite came out. Mm -hmm. They were like, I want to, I'm going to be a cage fighter. They would all mm -hmm. fucking rip me apart, which is <laughs> what I would do too. So yeah. But I, I remember that, you know, like, and I, I was like, man, you can't talk all that shit and then, and then bitch it. So here we go. And when I, I knew it was just going to take me getting on a team. Cause when I had, like, we were kind of building a good team. I had Yahtzee Mason was over there training, but they're all smaller, you know, and then Joe and then Gilbert. And when I left, uh, you know, Gilbert was kind of wanting to go over there and like y'all team ended up coming over there. So like we started building some guys I had from that team. And then when I met Drew, I knew that once I got into a place and got a team that I would fit right in because I work hard, you know? Um, and, that, and, and I'm about that. I'm about, it's, it's a give and take. That's how it is. You know, some, I think some days probably the only way you're going to stay on Drew Fickett's team is through hard work. And if you don't, he's probably going to run you out of the gym. Oh, he, 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 he made fun of me all the time. My first fight at 170, I said, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm fighting out in a tournament. I was supposed to fight uh, Tim Kennedy. Okay. From ACS. Yeah. Yep. 
and um, not no, not that's McKenzie you're thinking of maybe. Oh, okay, yeah, you're right. Yep. Oh, Tim Kelly's the Marine pro. guy. Yep, Tim yep. Kelly's the Marine guy. Yep, you're right. He fought in the IFL, and uh, and I was like, uh, I'm gonna fight at 170 because that, that uh, I've always wanted to do a Grand Prix, and they had like where you fight multiple times in one day, old school Don Fry style. I was all stoked, and then when I got up there, they were like, Yeah, well. We're only letting you do one fight. The boxing commission stepped in. I was like, motherfucker. But before that, Drew was like, hey, you're fighting at 170. You're never going to make it. And I remember being so fucking mad at him. I'm like, what? And he's like, you're not going to make weight. And I was like, but you're fucking crazy. I was so pissed. But that was like the first time he ever really even talked to me. Like, we would drill and shit. But, but, but it was just like real, real subtle. And after that, like, we just... We we're about the same size and I was always training. So we just started training and, and working hard and and then well, well let's talk about that room. It's it's real interesting that um you know you guys like in that room, you guys have Dominic Cruz in there. And Dominic never gets acknowledged, like his roots in Arizona are never acknowledged, like ever. You know, it's always what takes place in California, but his foundation happened in drew fickett's gym am i correct when i say that well yeah so it it wasn't at southwest but he but drew drew had this team scrub that was his thing he's like team scrub so like it did in in a weird way it was it's like where it doesn't matter where we train you know it didn't like we got kicked out of gym we got kicked out of this place. it didn't matter we're like we're gonna go train and get ready we're gonna win with whatever we got that's like drew's team scrub that's kind of what it meant to me and he, so Travis DeGrau, Leo's, uh, Lozon, Efren Escondero, because he used to tra- he used to wrestle at Pima, Dom. And there was a bunch of fighters that fought at, that wrestled at Pima, like Jamie Varner, Jesse Forbes, Dominic, uh, Efren, and all those wrestlers want to fight. <laughs> so, so when they all got out, they all kind of like started training together. And, and Dom used to train with Drew and all them. I had met met dom separate from drew but we, they were all connected in a weird way i just i met dom we were both fighting at um at jobbing.com and we we're both scared and fighting some grown-ass men so we just started like talking to each other that's how i met dom i had no idea that they were friends until i really got to know dom but they're all connected like drew I, there's so many good guys that drew that drew had a huge part in um, getting them ready. Well, what was it like having Dominic Cruz in that room you know, at such an early stage in his career? Well, you know what? Even then, though, even then, bro, he always saw things that he was he was looking at life like you're looking through a telescope and and taking your eye out and looking down here. Because sometimes you'll be looking way down there and you'll just trip, you'll never get there. Dom always saw everything. And he was always like, he brought like a, a, a level of discipline that that was the first thing I noticed from him was, was he was like so disciplined and drew was very disciplined when it came to training, but a wild boy, you know what I'm saying? Like, so him, him and drew were so different, but in the room, they're all the same. And like, that was the first thing I noticed was like, uh, Dom had all these little gimmicks. Like, he, like I, I jump up for 15 minutes. I don't drink eight weeks before five. He had all these, like, little rules, you know? And Drew had no rules but <laughs> one. And, but, but they both respected each other because when, when, it was, when they got in the gym, like, it was all about training. Like, everyone was just there to get better. And, and, and we, went, we went to a fight. Like, if one's getting thrown out, we're all getting thrown out. Like, huh? hey. It's my daughter and some dude. They're always flirting with each other. Uh oh. Hey, snap, go snap his neck. <laughs> yeah, we need uh, we need the hits. Here, just bring yeah, your phone. So, when you handle like this, they, they were all. Um, it, it it was a really good, it was a really good room, and everybody had a goal. Like, and and that's what MMA did for me. It's like it gave me light at the end of the tunnel because before that, there was really nothing. You know, I just remember like fumbling through life and going to this party and that party and just always feeling like, man, fuck this, like, fuck this, fuck this, fuck this, fuck this guy, fuck that. 
And when I got MMA, I mean, it didn't matter that I worked at a wastewater treatment plant. It didn't matter. Like none of that mattered. I did not care as long as I could train at the end of the day. And that was good. That was all that mattered. And, and Drew, it didn't matter who you were, where you like, what you look like. All that mattered was you're going to show up and train. And you're going to fight. Did it, does it surprise you to see Dominic where he's at right now? I mean, he's a brilliant combat. He has a brilliant combat sports mind. No. When we went up, me and Dom, he came up. Don Fry was fighting in Globe. And Uriah Faber was on the card. Casey Cola was on the card. We were just watching. And we were going up there, and I was like, I was looking at the guys my weight, because the guys do. So there's a guy even close to my size. I'm like, yeah, I'll beat his ass. <laughs> like, you know, like you could not even know him, you know? And we watched some of the guys fight in the car. And he's like, you think you can beat those guys at your weight? And I was like, yeah. And I was like, you're right, favor fought. And I said, you think you could beat him? And he said, he said, it'd be tough, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit smaller or whatever. And I was like, I think you could beat him. Even, even all the way back then, like, it was, always, it was always just like his commitment. He was always so dedicated, you know, like, he wasn't going out. It, when we went out, we party and stuff. But he was always like thinking about tomorrow, like thinking about the next day. Like you can't be drinking all, all weekend and going dehydrated and, and spar Ryan Bader on Monday, Seth. It's not gonna work out for you. Like he used to say things like that to me, like <laughs> you know, like your your brain's not gonna have any hydration. And then you got that big old guy hitting you. That's not good for you. Like you'd always think about things that you would think is his common sense but he always just broke everything down and and that's how he breaks everything down in his life it's it's all through uh you know analysis and logic just so when you when you when you look at dominic cruz's background they say he grew up in a trailer in like in a trailer park in arizona did, did you guys kind of have that bond because you guys kind of came from the same you know you guys from the same place in life he was from a different town i didn't know him I just met him and he was cool. You know, like he was just cool. He was just like, I liked him. And then I heard him talk shit to Roland Sahara. And I was like, I really like this guy. <laughs> yeah, he, he fought in, um, in like four corners. It's in the middle of nowhere. It's all dust. And the guy I was fighting came in and saw me weigh in and was like, like, I'm not fighting that guy. So he bounced. And then I had, you know, I was, I was single back then. So I had a bunch of girls with me and Dom fought and Dom's like, Hey, what's you doing dog? And I'm like, nothing. And he's like, where are you going? I was like, we're going to go party or whatever. He's like, who's with you? I said, you know, all these, all I'm with these people. And he's like, where are you guys going? I was like, you want to come? And like, we just always kicked it. You know, like we, it was always cool. Like it, I, I, I could tell right off the bat, like, he was like, he was, he would tell you exactly what he thought. And that's what I liked about him. Like he was just very honest, even if it hurt your feelings kind of, and, and maybe it's cause I'm a glutton for punishment. Maybe that's why I liked him so much, but he was just very honest. And, and, and you could tell he was thinking about tomorrow. Like he was trying to make something happen out of it. So I'm trying to imagine things. I, I imagine Roland Saria probably gave him a $35 check and he gave him a piece of his mind. Yeah, yeah, he, he said to. something about his blonde hair dog he, he had like he, you know back then dudes used to buy dye their tips and shit yeah and he and dom just got him beating some dude's ass just moving up just dude didn't even touch him just whoop, 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 just body shot the shit out of him and i remember thinking like man i ain't never seen nobody move like that his he, movement is insane and it's his own movement he reminded me i i, I watched boxing but I never had a boxing coach. He reminded me of Willie Pep, like an MMA Willie Pep. That's what, that was the first thought I had when I saw him. One of the greatest defensive fighters ever to live. Just Willie the way Pep. he moved, like he had this really herky jerky, but it was like his own, no one has a rhythm like that. And Roland, and <laughs> Roland said something about his dyed hair because that was Roland's thing. Like he was always jealous of everyone that had the balls to fight. So he would, like the little guys on his shows, like get on the microphone, you know, like, oh, you need a tan or something, like kind of shit on him. And he said something about Dom's hair and Dom and Dom just got crazy on him. And I'm like, oh, I really like this guy. <laughs> He's a little firecracker, you know? It's my kind of guy. So so you you got two wins in a row. You're rolling to Seth Ballantine, December 2nd, 2006, where you hit an armbar. 
I talked so much shit before that fight about Tim Tim Sylvia. So I I don't know Tim Sylvia, but he got he got tapped out in an ankle lock. And I'm like, man, does that even break bones? And someone's like, nah, it just hurts. And I'm like, I'll never tap that out. Quit fighting. And that dude got me in a gnarliest ankle lock. And I'm like, well, you really fucked yourself here, Seth. <laughs> like, <laughs> he fucked my leg up, dude. He fucked my ankle up. It started popping and it scared him. So he let go. But he looked at the ref and I was like, I'm good. And I got up and I stomped my foot. It was fucked up. But, and then I arm barred him. But my, my foot was, I learned jujitsu was not a game that day. I was like, all right, you really need to learn how to start defending this shit. Cause it was, I mean, that those were the dudes that won back in the day is if you had a skill set, it's not, if you had all skill sets, mm -hmm. now guys have all skill sets. Like they can stand up, they can wrestle, they can do jujitsu. There's a blueprint, but back then, like if a guy had a jujitsu and the other guy didn't, they went to the ground, it was over. You know, like, like guys were so, it was so premature and so different. Um, that was a, that was a, he was Seth Ballantyne, I think he was an army dude, but he had some karate. He threw a, skin back, a spinning back kick at me, and I had no idea what the fuck that was. <laughs> when he threw that, I'm like, whoa, you don't want to get caught with that dog. <laughs> What's that, you know? It was crazy. So you take four months off, which is a long time for you because you're kind of rattling these things off once a month, and you get the call to the IFL. I think you were on Don Fry's team, am I correct, the Scorpions? Don Fry, the legend himself. Yes. Okay. I got it. So Rich Moss knew Don Fry's judo coach, and they needed an 85er. It, it might have been Shane Battlecat. I can't remember. If it was Shane Battlecat or Dwayne Johnson, one or the other. Compton. Compton. Maybe I'm saying it wrong. I'm sorry if I did Mr. Compton. I know his last name was Compton. And I had to go down and spar Don Fry. I straight up, they're like, hey, you got to go spar Don Fry and Mike Whitehead oh. to, see you're, to see if you're good enough to make it. And I'm like, in my mind, I'm like, I'm going to fuck these dudes up because I trained with heavyweights. Like, I trained with Gilbert and Joe for so long. Like, I knew how to navigate around heavyweights pretty easy. And, and I had to just fucking move, you know? And I was like, all right, well, like, we got to do it. Let's go. And so they're like, next Friday, we're going down there. You're going to spar. I said, all right, cool. And I walk in, and Don Fry has purple spandex on. And, dog, they're not – they're like the girl spandex, the ones that you pull the thing under the ankle. You know, it's got, like, the little <laughs> plastic thing on the bottom. You remember from the <laughs> 80s, the girls used, to, girls used to put those on, and they used to put up the big old socks in the Reeboks. Mm-hmm. But he had some purple spandex on. I don't know if he had underwear, but I could see everything he had on underneath it, you know, stuck to his skin. And he was jacked, dog. Shirt off the whole time, just arr, arr, winking at everybody in the place. <laughs> and we're going to spar. So we get in there and we're moving around. He has big ass headgear. And I remember thinking, like, all right, man, like, you don't want to get hit with this dude. So I'm like, just using the speed. And I could tell there was a distinct speed, speed advantage like right away. And I started landing some big shots. And he goes, after that round, like, because he's a G, he's not going to stop in the, real, in the middle of the round. He waited till the round was over. And it was like, what size blood, what size bloods you got on? And I said, 16s. He's like, get my 16s. This boy's cheating. He told him. <laughs> I said, huh? I'm just like so take it back Stop like, yeah i couldn't believe he said i was cheating because i used six i'm like those are standard glove size and i he's like whatever i'm gonna get my 16s like i was like all right dog so then he got them on and i started really landing some shots we started getting in then like the third fourth round he started getting tired we're only supposed to go like two and i remember thinking oh. i remember thinking like he's not gonna stop until he wins around and I go to the corner and I'm like, yeah, hey, I think I think I need to, I think I need to slow like the pace down a little bit or something. And it was clear in my mind he wasn't stopping unless. So like he ends up getting me like that over under. 
mm -hmm. that, you know, where he grab, he kind of like grabs the head, but he was like, he had an under. It's like a plum. It's like a half he, tie he's plum. He's beating on my ribs, beating on my head. And once he felt like he got, he got around, he's like, yeah, we're good. And then I had to spar two with Mike Whitehead. And my, hey, Mike Whitehead was coming in hot. I don't think he liked Tucson very much. And I was moving because he's like 260, man. He's huge. huge. And, and you've, you've, you mean, you're, you're shark tanked at this time, at this point. I was so young, bro. I didn't, I didn't even think about getting tired, bro. I tell kids all the time, how old are you? They're like 20. Well, you're not allowed to be tired till you're 30. Shut up. Like, let's <laughs> go. And I was like, uh, I could go, you know? So we were going, I was moving. And I remember I was landing some shots on him, but I was being cautious because one shot could be a bad deal for me. And I remember he yelled at me and goes, why don't you box me? And I go, I am stupid. Like you're 260 pounds. What do you want me to stand there and slug? Like, you know, like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and then he freaking like grabbed me and hip tossed me over the ring. To grab me, hip toss over the ring. Dog. I went over the rope, landed on my back and Don Fry came in there, bro. Straight up. Grabbed him up, started. He kicked, I think he kicked him out of Tucson and kicked him out of the U.S., dog. <laughs> Don, Don Fry was just like, yeah, he's going crazy. You act like that. And Mike, get out of this gym. Get out of Tucson. Get out of Arizona. <laughs> like, he kicked him out of the whole You went pro wrestling at him. <laughs> yeah, bro. And I was like, right at that moment, I was like, Don Fry is awesome. You know, because he could have fucked me up. Like, oh, he, he tried to hurt me. On some shit. Yeah, yeah. He was pissed. And then, well, 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 where he came from, the military fun. fighting system, that was kind of commonplace there. I didn't know that. I didn't know nobody, you know. Um, I, I, I don't hold it against him. I get it. Hey, in sports, people get frustrated, right? But um, I definitely wasn't a fan of his. No, That's no. And you, know, so you, you pass the test. You make yeah, it to the IFL. The so now you're actually seeing a decent check for a fight but the level of competition is night and day to what you're used to i was so blown away that i was going to be able to just guess fight out of the state you know it was in connecticut the mohegan sun everything's new to me right Every, like the whole thing i travel by myself they all travel from tucson so I go to the airport in Phoenix. They're on different flights. I'm I'm at the I'm at the airport in Connecticut for a long time waiting for them. They get in and Don Fry's hammered drunk. And in Connecticut, they stopped selling beer pretty early. I I think like ten or whatever. And he's just like, God damn, where can you get a goddamn beer on here? And he's just freaking out, wanting some full beers. No, which I get. Because when I did drink, when I drank, I was like him. And he he just had us going to all these different places, looking for beers. They kept telling him the same thing, like, hey, homie, we stopped selling at 10 or whatever. So it was like, I could tell, like, it was a, it was going to be a real fun weekend already. Like, just because Don was making me laugh. Some guys were annoyed, but I thought it was hilarious, you know. And and then. Oh, you're used to your cricket, too. Yeah, we, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what your niche is. Like, nobody's perfect, right? Everyone's got something about them. And it's like, I can handle that because I've had so many of my people in my life like that. I can handle those guys all day. Um, which I definitely got to touch base on that later with my Jesse Forbes, or, or not Jesse Forbes, uh, Jesse Taylor and Orduel's story. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, there were so many guys. There was like, oh, the, the, all the pit bulls were there. Um, so the Pitbulls were Henzo's, Henzo's team. Yeah. Uh, Carlos Newton had the Dragons. You guys were the Scorpions. I think there was one other team. I'm not sure what it. The Wolverines. It was the Wolverines? Oh, the Anacondas. Not wolves, the wolves, too. Wolves, like the Oregon Wolves or whatever. Or because yeah. uh, Chael Sonnen was there. I remember it was the first time I saw Chael Sonnen. I didn't know him. I didn't know shit. But he looked like a funny dude. Like he was just always laughing and shit. You know. And I was like, man, like, what's it? this dude kind of looks like uh, this this dude kind of is a, is a different looking individual, you know, like he don't look like he'd be fighting. He's real. And back then he was real young. 
and they had a member at Matt Horwich. Oh, dude, he was a wild man. Well, he was really smart, though. He's a little socially awkward, but he was real smart. You could tell. And we were he's all good. Like he's fuck. good if you could get him to, 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 to shower once a month. That's a that's a that's a serious issue in a jujitsu gym. Is you gotta you gotta you gotta wash your body as a as a service to the community. <laughs> um, yeah, and you're 100. percent But I liked him. He was a little socially awkward, but I liked him. And Dom was again hammer drunk the next day, and he had a fucking he had a he had a outfit on that would make Donald Cerrone. No matter what Donald Cerrone was wearing, it would just put him down. He had a sick ass like cowboy shirt on and he had a he white had like did he have the string tie like the shoestring no nah, it was it was just it was like three buttons down by then because he was three sheets past it you know but he had all these turquoise and crazy ass jewelry on and he was fucking he was he was ready to go and we're all sitting in the lobby <laughs> and he was drinking some cold beers i mean boss rootings there you got all these crazy famous people there and I don't know how, I didn't know how it happened at the time, but <laughs> Matt Horwich comes up to Don Fry with like a list of groceries. And he's like, real socially weird, you know? He's like, hey, Don, can, 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 you're going to the store, can you, he has money and, and a list. And he goes, can you give me some, some bread and some meat? I want a sandwich. And Don Fry looks at him and goes, you think this is a fucking game? <laughs> I'm, like, I'm, like, I'm like, what's happening here? Dude, Don jumps up and like starts taking his jewelry off. Like I thought he was going to straight scrap. And Chael comes over laughing and Dennis Holman. And then they oh. try to break it up. And Don pushes one of them. And then him, him and Holman almost get into it. Like this big old fight almost erupts. I guess Chael saw him in. Uh, he, uh, Horowitz was like, I need to go get a sandwich. And he's like, go ask Don. He's going. He was just like, fuck him with Don. <laughs> so he was like, he was like go gooning him all the way back then. You know, like it was such a crazy, all these people just getting ready to scrap like 8 p.m. And it was, it was wild back then. Like dudes are real crazy. It's way mm -hmm. tame now because social media and cameras, you can't be fist fighting in the, in the lobby like back in the day. No, <laughs> Don Fry was ready to go though. No so what was what was the process like? You you Don had to be in your corner, obviously. Were you comfortable with that at that time? Did it matter to you? You know, I remember I, I fought Brett Bull Parlant. It was a good fight. Like it was a really good fight. Um, and I got a cut. Like I think in the second round, he was like in a scramble. He elbowed me, and. All, all I remember Don really saying was like, you're fine, you're fine, you're good, this guy's gas. Like, he never really gave me any anything else. But but in a weird way, it calmed me down because knowing, like, he's fought and shit, like, knowing that he's been there. And, dude, I don't give a care. Like, having Don in front of you with a cowboy hat in your corner, I'm cool with that every day. <laughs> he's, he's one of my favorite fighters of all time. And he, you know, he, he had no filter. He just said exactly what was on his mind, no matter who was there. And I always, you always respect that because you know what you're going to get, you know? Well, there's no show there. It's, this is who I am. I'm not, you know, uh, I'm not afraid to show you who I am. Like it's a lot of people, they're scared to show their real selves where Don can walk out the front door and man, this is it, man. It's, you know, love me or hate me, it's cool, but I'm not going to change. Yeah, he was just straight up, like, and, and he was, like, down the scrap, too. Like, he was just, like, if you showed up and fought, like, that's all that mattered, you know? Like, it wasn't anything else. There was no, like, fucking politics in it. There's no bullshit. Like, he was cool. How was and it dealing he was, with the owners? A lot of fun. Huh? How, how was it dealing with the owners of the IFL? I never dealt with them. I fought for him twice, and then it kind of, like, dissolved. Um, I, I heard after I fought for him a few times that I guess guys were getting like money every month. I never got no money every month. Um, mm -hmm. See, I, I was so going to ask you that because where you come from with, with the, you know, Arizona scene, you know, you may not even have seen like a, 
you know, a contract or anything like that. Now the IFL, you really, you, you had to sign something and stuff. Is that scary? You, you, if you don't have a lawyer, it's like, what do you, well, what were your thoughts with that? Or you're like, I'm in, I don't care. Like a lot of the, a lot of the early guys in the early part of their career, USC early guys sign, sign me up. You know, it doesn't matter, but were you thinking about that? There was, there was, there was some, some, some drawbacks where I was like, but then I'm looking at it. If you, if you pull it out and look at it and give a 50,000 mile view, it's like, all right, well, you can keep fucking with Roland Sahara and make $35 a fight. Mm -hmm. um, you're not getting any younger. And it was just an opportunity to compete, you know, and I, and, and, you know, I, I hope the game's changed quite a bit because, you know, back, back when we used to find a local scene, like guys would get paid quite a bit more. And when I, when I got cut from the UFC um, and was trying to get fights, I was so blown away how much the market had changed. And, and like, uh, and it's from guys taking fights for, for whatever they can. You know, so that that was definitely a, a thought, though. And it was definitely like, all right, well, like every time you're in these fights, like you're going to be getting hit in the head, it's taking years off your body, it's taking years off your life. Like, you know, but it was definitely more money than I was making at the sanitation plant, too, you know, so. Um, it's just life changer. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was just an opportunity and and, and the opportunity. I had kids I already had, you know, a son and it was just more about put money in the bank and, and get and have an opportunity to go compete. And like, cause I wanted to fight in the UFC cause that was the only thing that was around then. But um, I definitely wanted to travel and fight and, and, and the game changed so much. Like guys travel and there's so much um, knowledge that's spread. Cause guys go to different gyms. It's like so much different now. It's so much cooler than well, it was when well, I was a kid. Your next fight in the AFL was against an opponent that started at heavyweight and worked his way down to 85 named Dan Molina. Oh, yeah. He, he, that was the only way I was going to lose that fight, too. That guy was huge. Yeah, it was the only way. I remember I remember someone saying, yeah, it's the only way you're going to lose that fight is if he heel hooked you. And he heel hooked me. <laughs> you know, I, I thought, I, you know, I thought I drilled it enough and obviously didn't. Um, and he did a good job of, of securing it. And I, you know, back then there were so many times, if I go back and watch some of my old fights, I, you, I just lose no composure, you know, like it, it, it really, uh, there's some maturity in the Yeah, fight. it really hurts me to see those fights. Like if I yeah. look at them now, it's like looking in the sun, it like hurts my eyes, <laughs> you know? Well, your, your record, I mean, your videos on YouTube are pretty much scrubbed like very little independent indie grind video footage of you exists. It's, it's, it, was, it was Joe Biden, man. He knows I support Donald Trump. He scrubbed him on. <laughs> that's, I'm, that's jo it. I'm joking. I'm joking. Well, it was probably Roland Saria who... <laughs> yeah, who... Yeah. <laughs> that, who that guy's I video mean, library is amazing, and he's got nothing online. Yeah, he probably tries to still sell DVDs, I bet. Oh my God, I wouldn't doubt that, man. I wouldn't doubt that. So you go from Molina to Miguel, a Bodog co-promoted show, um, Tough Enough, you fight uh, Chris Kennedy. So you're on a two-fight skid, and online your record appears to be four and five. It's a little beat up, but I think those amateur fights got added afterward, as you had stated. But, yeah. you know, it's a little beat up. It's like actually like four and three if you subtract some of those. There was definitely a couple long, uh, long conversations with myself on the way home from the gym where I was like, you need to figure something out around that time. You know, I, I was already training with Drew and them, um, but I, it was clear to me that I was getting better and I was bigger than a lot of the guys at my gym. So, you know, Gilbert had passed away and Joe, Joe would train, but. I couldn't spar with him like that anymore because he was getting older too, you know, can be just like taking all kinds of shots and shit all the time. Um, and I was like, it was clear to me that I needed to start getting guys that were like more my size. And uh, I They'll think right around on your fights. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Right, be, right around, yeah. right around there. I think uh, was Maybe, maybe, I don't know, maybe a year later, we got, everyone got sponsored for MTX. Guys used to get sponsorship, like monthly sponsorships and shit. 
And I remember being so happy because like uh, I had money to hire like a good coach, like a striking coach. And then I found, I was just looking for a long time, finding somebody like, it was important to me to get somebody that had MMA knowledge and then could deal with a long rangey fighter. And I found this card of uh, Rob Monroe. He's a cut man for the UFC now, but it was uh, him holding a pads with Carlos Condon on it. And I was like, hey, Condon fights cool. I like to fight like that. And I, I remember being happy because I had that money I could invest into a coach. So I started working with him. And then I was just kind of looking around for, for guys to start wrestling with that were more my size and could, could help me deal with, because it was clear to me, like dealing with guys, it was going to be like, I had a decent back game. I was good off my back. I was okay enough. So got, guys were just like going to take me down. That's how everyone's going to beat me. They're going to point fight me at that point in my career. I felt like guys were just going to point fight me. So it was, it was very, uh, it was very clear to me. I had to, I had to make a change and I started doing what I could just finding what I could. And, Eventually, I ended up working with Robin Rowe and a bunch of those Brian Bader and all them. That's kind of my kind of where I ended up going in the long about route anyway. So your fight against Chris Kennedy, you get a knockout in the first round. It's a really good bounce back fight. I think was it where, where was that fight? at? was it in Vegas, I'm assuming that was that was. Yep. I was in Vegas. That was one that was supposed to be a tournament. Um, it, it was like. Tough enough, but it was like a Bodog promotion. Yeah, Miguel, like, did you have any play in that? How... Were you still there at that at that point? Tough enough is a guy named uh, Myers. Is like Gary Myers, it was, I believe, is his name. It was Barry uh, Barry, Barry Meyer. Meyer. Yeah, yeah, Barry, dude, Barry uh, Meyer he, passed, he passed away. Yeah, and yeah. but he was he was a Vegas person. Like his father uh, had inns at the casinos that they used and stuff. Like they 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 were wealthy. And because it's an amateur show, they were always able to operate, even with the UFC in town, they, they managed the politics. So that was Barry Meyer's show. And Barry was very good friends with Jeff. So that's after my run. So at what, Jeff I, yeah, yeah. And so that's after my run at Bodog, because that's probably not a connection I would have used. Tough enough was still kind of an amateur show or a smaller entity there. So, but anyway, um, Seth, did I meet you? You came to Russia one time, didn't you? Yeah. I did meet you. You were cornering. Uh, yeah, uh, I was cornering Robert McClintock. No, I was I was friends with McClintock. Oh, it's Jacob um, McClintock. Right yep, there. Jacob. Yeah, remember he got his eyes swole up real bad. That was a great fight. That was a great fight. The reason the reason I asked though is that you were with the Lollies at that point, and I know that you know Joe called him Pex and and uh, you know Drew Drew got thrown out of the school there and stuff. But they go back a long way, all the way to like Matt Hume and stuff. And they, they talk about that relationship and how they work into the mix with you. You know, they, they were cool. Like, uh, I never had a personal issue with them. You know, like, it was just clear to me, like, they had a, all kinds of big fights over there. And if I came in there, I was going to be, I knew I was just going to be like a sparring dummy for everybody. So I had to get, I wanted to go somewhere where I could get some, like, some, some technical, um, some technical one-on-ones and kind of learn how to navigate through some of these situations. And later on, I started going, I, I had met them cause they all knew Santino and they were always cool to me. Like I never had a real problem with them. If you talk MMA with them, those guys always got along good with them. It's just, I always thought it was funny that Joe Riggs called the vets. That was just all mm-hmm. I, I always think of that. Mm-hmm. Um, but those guys were always cool. And, you know, I remember going over there, they had like Steve Steinbess, who I'm really good friends with. Ray Steinbest, Jesse Forbes, Aaron Simpson, CB Del Dollar Hawkins Day. there, huh? Was Del Hawkins there as well? Yeah, I think he was for a little bit. Um, there was just so I many was, like, good. Watching it. So there were yeah, so that's... many good fighters, you know. And I was just kind of doing my own thing. Like I would train my jujitsu at Santino's. I go to Robin Rose, and I go there for sparring. And I ended up just kind of end up having to go there all the time because they were the only guys that. You know, I was I was the worst in the room. They used to beat the shit out of me all the time, so I felt like I was getting better. Uh, are you comfortable talking? With, why was Drew asked to leave there? I don't know, um, and that's one thing I've always I've always stayed away from. That's um, smart. Be, just because everyone 
in my opinion, will like in, in, inject themselves into uh, a situation, but they're not in it, you know? So there's always so many different factors. And so, so it could be the interpretation of what Drew did or the interpretation of what the lollies did. All I ever did was put it on face value. They're always cool to me and I'm always cool to them. And mind your I own just, business. Yeah, That's I just it. wanted I just wanted to get better. And when I went in there, I talked about fighting with them, and that was it, you know. And I still have a good relationship with all of them. That's good. So just to kind of tie a knot on that, Barry Meyer, what well, one you, you won by knockout in the first round against Chris Kennedy, which you know, you got an airplane ride, you know, you're in Vegas and you know, you, you do well, you do what you're supposed to do. Uh, Barry Meyer. I really liked him a lot. He and I used to talk on the phone all the time, just about like regional fights that that could take place. Unfortunately, you know, depression and, you know, other mitigating factors kind of came in and, you know, and he, he departed early, but what a phenomenal human being that guy was. You know, it, it was definitely one of the shows where uh, I was, I was bummed that they didn't have more of them. You know, it was fun. They had a good setup and, Anytime you fight in Vegas, it's good, man. Like, you know, that's, that's where, Come that's, where the, yeah, that's, I remember, I remember my first fight in Vegas walking out and seeing like Jeremy Horn and all these dudes in the front row getting ready to watch me. And I'm like, I didn't think of that. <laughs> like, you know, like, that's pretty so, cool, like, man. Yeah, it was just, it, it's just a cool place, man. It's, it's the fight station of the world. Yeah. All right. So from here, all right, you go and do something that, I hope Drew Fickett was your corner for this. Full moon fighting in Mexico. You fight Keto, a future Ultimate Fighter uh, uh, veteran, Keto Andrews. Yeah. Yep. Um, it, 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 first off, Keto's from Team Alpha Male. Um, super tough fight. Um, you know, he normally fights at 205. And, you know, that's, that's a lot to chew on. I, th I think that's when I fought three times in one month. I fought Kennedy. Um, and then I had like, I either fought Kennedy and Andrews. And then I had a week off and I fought uh, Jordan Pagola. Yeah, that was like uh, about a month and a half. You fought three times. Yeah. Yeah, something like that. It was, and uh, I remember, yeah, he was tough. Um, and, you know, of all people, I'm down there and Santino had a wedding and then um, Joe had something else going on too. And we had our whole team down there and we had no coaches. So I had to corner everybody and then fight in the main event. Who was the promoter? Chad, uh, Josh Graves. Man, there's a couple promoters in Mexico. It just, it didn't end well for them. No, he, it was, it was, he used to fight in the IFL. Um, he was a heavyweight. And they were cool. Like it was, it was a cool little show, especially from Southern Arizona. It's a five and a half hour trip. We all get to go down there. They'd always get multiple guys on the on the card. And those are some of the funnest fights in my career. Are the ones where, you know, back in the day, when when you're all just cruising down there with your team. And Drew was there. <laughs> Drew was. Uh, I don't think he made it very much through the the whole event, but he was down there. Uh, <laughs> I think you might have. I think you might have got booted early or something. Something happened to him, and I had I'm to sure corner it wasn't everybody. Due to his, of uh, his own fault. I'm sure yeah. it was that. I had to corner everybody and then fight in it. And of all people, I remember being so fucking pissed that Mike White said, like, "You don't got a corner." I was like, "Huh?" And he's like, "I'll be in your corner." I was like, "Damn!" I remember. I, remember I was so mad he was in my corner, but. uh yeah, Keto Andrews was a tough fight. Like, um, well, had Keto Andrews is legit, a legit guy. And you win in the third round by triangle. How did the first two rounds go? I, I could honestly, dude, to be honest, I could have choked him out in the first minute with a triangle. But I had this weird little thing in my mind because I come from the other side of tracks. Like Tim Kennedy was a cop. Keto Andrews was a prison guard. And Jordan Pergola was a firefighter. You talk about Chris Kennedy. Yeah, Chris Kennedy, I'm sorry. Chris Kennedy. He was a yeah. cat. Yep. Keto Andrews was a prison guard. And then I had a week or something off. I was fighting Jordan Pagola in Florida, and he was a, a firefighter. So I was like, in my weird, in my own little weird mind, 
I was like, I'm gonna fuck all these government employees up. <laughs> Cause I was on was... probation my whole life. Like I'm gonna fuck this dude up, I'm gonna fuck this dude up. It was just his own little war I made in my mind. That you're doing remember... nation business on the first responders. Yeah, I was gonna clean the house for him. I was gonna show him what's up. Mm -hmm. You know, I was gonna let my brother, I was gonna let my brother and all his homies on the yard, all my boys that have been locked up, I'm gonna let. I'm gonna let them all know I fucked this cop up, I fucked the prison guard up, and I fucked the firefighter up for all you guys. <laughs> you know, maybe I'll throw a riot or something, whatever you wanna do. Mm -hmm. But that was this weird little thing I made in my mind. I could have choked him out. And I, I remember I was like, man, I want a TKO. I wanted to get a TKO. And I swept him and he had a good chin, bro. I was, I was hit, I hit him so many times and the ref didn't miss the call. Like he just had a real good chin. And I ended up, I ended up catching him in the triangle in the third round. You know, I, I didn't want to not get a finish, but it sounds arrogant. I, I, I tell you that, what, that, when I saw that finish, yeah, when I saw that finish on your record, I was shocked. I'm like, I just figured it's definitely a step up. Like those IFL fights that you struggled with, you know, uh, you know, a few fights prior, this was of that caliber, and you found a finish. Like that's. Like you're, you're leveling up. You can see yourself maturing and getting better. Yeah, we, we had good training partners. Um, you know, I, I drilled a lot, you know. It, 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 it was every MMA guy that's good, there's a team behind him, you know. Um, yeah. Drew and all those guys from Team Scrub, like he brought a bunch of wrestlers in. I was going and, and sparring with good guys. And that, that was really it was just me finding a way and whatever I had to do. I mean, there, there was times I would get off work and go work out and then sleep in the parking lot to work out with Rob, you know, before I went home, just lay there in my car and rest for an hour and a half before. It. So, I mean, like we, I, I started figuring a little formula out there, you know, I started getting a little momentum. I started getting a little confident and, and then I started like really hitting my stride right around then. Well, let's, let's talk about those Mexico shows existed so that you wouldn't have to deal with commissions. Oh yeah. So it was highly unregulated. Usually there's a lot like some narco traffic activity. Sometimes there's, there's some birds fighting in, in certain areas of those events. Um, did you witness any of that? Bro, well, my last fight in Mexico was, I mean, it's way down the road. But yeah, bro, like it's Mexico. <laughs> like we who. We 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 would get shooken down every time we were there. The cops would pull us over. They go through the whole thing, like the whole negotiation of how much we're gonna pay for them to go away. <laughs> you know, it, it's Mexico. That's what it is. Um, yeah, but it, it those to me those were the funnest trips. Like those were the funnest trips because it was just about all of us training. We all had a reason to train. We all had something to get ready for, and we had we we had so much fun on those fights. Like even guys that won guys that lost like it was always a blast you know we always had such a good time is, is, it, true, those... is it true that mexico is more fun with a drunk drew fickett listen drew fickett <laughs> we he was cornering his cat one time and he was hammered drunk i mean i'm talking tuxedo front front row tuxedo t-shirt front row <laughs> <laughs> So he, he he wore his finest T-shirt. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. What time is it? You're not leaving us in the middle of a Drew Fickett story. No, no. I was just, <laughs> just kidding. Um, yeah, no. He he was. There was this guy Carlos that was fighting, and he wasn't very good, but he was fighting this dude that was a like a legitimate um like a legitimate jujitsu guy, and could. And Carlos dropped him. And all of us were surprised. <laughs> like everyone in the corner, went, whoa. And Drew ran up to the cage and the guy's head was in the cage. And one second, this guy keeps texting me and he's bothering me. And this guy, you there? This yep. guy's head was in the cage, like up on the cage. And Carlos was hitting him, trying to get the finish. And Drew runs to like the other side of the fence. And he's got... His fingers like on the fence, he's screaming in the dude's ear, die, 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 die. Like he's going <laughs> real crazy. He was, <laughs> but he was going crazy, bro. And he was, and then I remember just stepping back and looking at him, and he had no shoes on, socks, 
and they were dirty as fuck. He was just <laughs> fucking ripping it, dude. <laughs> and man, my boy Yatim comes up and is like, fuck, what are we going to do with Drew tonight after these fights? I'm like, I don't know, bro. Try to find a bed for him and lay him down, I guess. <laughs> I don't know what we're going to do with him. But he was just wild, bro. He used to say the craziest shit, like Travis the Grout, years after we fought, he had to fight some dude and Aaron Simpson being the last minute replacement. And Travis was like, yeah, they want me to fight Aaron Simpson. I said, yes. And he looks at him and goes, you're fighting Aaron Simpson now? And he goes, yeah. And he goes, Aaron Simpson's an all-American wrestler. You're an all-American wrestler. Aaron Simpson's a better all-American wrestler. <laughs> like, you, it was like, 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 very crazy. I was just grabbing his arm, like, come on, Drew. Like, he just always said the craziest shit, dude. Fucking love being with Drew. <laughs> He's my guy, man. You know, like, the, the thing about Drew is he could be completely inebriated and a 10 times better coach than most of the coaches on the planet. And as good of a fighter as he is, like he, his, his ability to get everyone to buy into a, his, his uh, law of enrollment, which is pretty much getting everyone to see your vision. Like he made it so much fun um, that you never wanted to miss practice. You know, you never wanted to miss practice. He made everything so much fun. And if you think about some of the guys he's, he's been a part of, um, Jamie Varner, Efren Escondero, Jesse Forbes, me, Dominic Cruz. I mean, there's so many fighters. I can't even remember them all right now that, that he really just kind of his philosophy of, cause so many fighters waste all their best years in the gym. You know, I mean, how many, how many fighters you seen that were scared to fight? That they always want, they always want a, a corpse. They want you to draw, draw, drag someone out there who's not going to fight back, you know. And and Drew, Drew wasn't about like your record or not, none of that shit. It was like, well, you go compete and then you find out where you're really at because it's the only true gauge is really competition. Like all your partners can know how you move and they know the things you're good at and human nature to avoid shooting on Ryan Bader. Yeah, I don't want to shoot on Ryan Bader. That shit hurts. So even though I know I probably should shoot, my, my body's not going to want to let me do that. So, like, the only true gauge is competition, and that's what it was always about, was, like, why, why all these guys spend this whole life in a gym and never compete, you know? And that's, that's, that's what I thought Drew always brought to the table, is he was just like, who gives a fuck? Let's fight next weekend. Oh, you lost? Okay, cool. Let's fight next weekend. Mm-hmm. Like, it was, it was just like, whatever, like, you know? He was just fucking Mike, you're on mute. So uh True Fickett, he uh he told us a crazy story about uh what is it a pizza place, Miguel? The uh, Papa John's. You we got were... kicked off the ultimate fighter. <laughs> were you in his life at that time? No. Um, but I remember yeah, you know, he didn't talk about it much back then because I think he, like, it was like, he, he, it, it still kind of hurt him back then that, that he wasn't on the ultimate fighter, but I kind of, I kind of like started getting to know him and he's one of them guys, like it takes a long time to get to know Drew, you know? And I remember hearing the story about him and I've been trying to find the video for years where, cause he told me he originally wanted to be Drew the Nightmare Fickett. So <laughs> Diego Sanchez, right? And I always thought that would have been a good fight even back then, you know? Mm-hmm. And Drew said he was interview- like he was at a show or something and someone had a VHS like, t- recorder and, he- and Drew interviewed him as a reporter though. <laughs> like, like, not as Drew Fickett. <laughs> so he was, he was playing a role. Drew Fickett and shit. <laughs> he pulled he pulled the biggest goon move on Diego Sanchez ever. I've been trying to find that interview desperately. Cool. So he would always do crazy shit like that, and it, you know he was he would he was always ready to go. When, and he had some real exciting fights too, man. Like he would he would he would pull off some wins where you're like, how did he even make it out of that? You know, without 
getting his head kicked off. And it was, he never quit. It would be like three seconds left in the fight. And, and he would, you can't say it's luck when somebody consistently does something. That's, and it, that's true. That's what, that's what MMA is so fucking awesome about is like, you may not be able to beat this guy at, at you, you look on the paper and you're like, this guy's going to smoke that guy. But there's so many little transitions and, and positions where guys can get finishes and guys can get chokes. And Drew, Drew is like the epitome of that. It's like finding a way. Like he would find a way, you know. And sometimes you don't know how you're going to beat him. And Drew, you know, sometimes you got to get in there and you got to fucking, you got to go through a, three rounds of shit to get it. And he did that against Koshik. He always pulled these crazy fights off. And I always thought. I Carlo always thought, Prater too. Dude, I was on Ultimate Fighter with Tito Ortiz, Chuck Liddell, Saul Solis. You guys remember him? Of yeah. course. Boxing coach. Recently, recently died. But, uh, yeah. Rest yeah, he was, cool. he was cool as fuck. I liked him. And he's like, you, you train with Drew Pickett? And I was like, yeah, I train with Drew. And he goes, man, that guy's one of the toughest guys I ever had fight for me. He said, I had a Grand Prix, which I've always wanted to fight in. And he said that he had, he had a tough, a tough row, a murderous row of guys. And he said Drew had a huge cut. And got stitched back up and went and beat Carlos Prater in a had a big cut and got stitched. I was like, man, I don't know why I always thought that was so cool to get stitched back up and go fight after it. <laughs> <laughs> Some rocky <laughs> moment. Yeah. But it's just, you know, it's just like uh he always did he he always did really well in those tournaments because of his endurance and and it's a lot of his brains too. Like he'll avoid stuff, he'll get guys tired, like you know, he'll find a way. The real strong yeah. guy. He's a totally unique dude. It's, it's, it's the interesting thing is a lot of you know sometimes the partying and stuff is what you hear first, but he's a high level dude. And and then people say, well, well, how good would he have been if he didn't party? And I think that misses a little bit of it because I think that uniqueness and that wackiness is part of him, man. You know that walk his own path. Keeps Take people guessing. He might not have been. Yeah, might not have been all that. You know, I think you. Oh, he's a total I think you're hundred percent. I think you're hundred percent right. Like I've seen guys in my career that were phenomenal finish artists. And sometimes every person's different. Sometimes if you take away and you give them a real structured life and you're like, well, what could this guy do if he, if he trained like Dominic Cruz, you know, and he, had, and he jumped rope for 15 minutes, but that's Dominic's way of getting ready. You know, like that's, that's how he gets ready. He jumps rope. He does this. He does that. And he's a, he's he's got this system. And all he knows is every time he does his system, when he goes to fight it, it's ready and it works. So he doesn't vary from it. But some guys, they're really good, and they'll stop partying and, and do all that dedication, and then it like takes away their uh, their recklessness. Like it takes away their freak because they'll go out there and just wow, they'll do some crazy stuff, and it makes them like. Uh, it almost makes them so it, it takes away the release almost, you know, like they, they mm -hmm. can't, it's too It'll stressful. I think that's why John Jones be effing everybody up. Cause that dude party like a rock star and still get it in, huh? He's a <laughs> savage, you know, but I've seen it. I've seen it happen and to each his own, like, you know, it, I ain't tripping, but I've always wondered that, like, there's no way to do a real experiment on that, you know, like how, you know, mm -hmm. so, it's just to the fighter, you know, and and that and then just sh shows like how hard this sport I and mean, every sport is is to be good at it for a long time and deal with life. That that's the hard part. Fight so, is easy. What was it like fighting for the XFC promoter? That's the Jordan Pergola fight where you won by triangle. What was it like fighting for John Prisco? What was your experience like? I moved, I just went there and weighed in, and he was cool. Like I didn't have any issues with him um when he, he found out that i fought the week before and he was kind of salty like oh you could get hurt and i'm like yeah well i'm here you know like so yeah, yeah, yeah. just to clean that up for, for you you said so february 1st you fought chris kennedy then february 23rd you went down to mexico and fought in that full moon show and then march 2nd all within a month three fights uh you were in this as xfc so a little different. yeah and xfc yeah. was a good organization yeah, it, it was cool. I mean, they, I, they had uh, – it was in Tampa Bay, um, and they had my boy Danny Martinez was on the card too. So I was – you know, he's one of my best friends, so I was real excited to get to go 
get to go get it in with him. And it was cool, man. Um, I was just happy to get out. I, I hurt my foot real bad in that Kiko, uh, Keto Andrews. I, I, I hurt my foot real bad. So I was happy to fight. I got out of it early with the win. I didn't, I wasn't worried really about any of that. I just wanted to get, I just wanted to rack off three wins and start moving to bigger shows. I wanted to get in like WC at that time. You know, you know what was, what, what, what's crazy is now you come full circle after that. And on June 7th, 2008, you're back on Rage in a Cage against Eddie a Crazy Face. I, you can't forget that nickname. Uh, future M1 veteran, Eddie Ares Mendy. Bro, Drew, I was in, in the Rodeo Lounge Bar and Grill and drinking an ice cold beer. And Drew called me. And Drew goes, what are you doing? Like real weird too. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> and I'm like, I'm drinking cold beers. What's up? I thought he was there because he was talking so weird to me. You know, I was like looking behind me and shit. <laughs> and he's like, you want to fight this weekend at the desert diamond casino? Like real crazy. And I go, yeah. Who am I fighting? He goes, does it matter? And I go, no. And he goes, be there at four or whatever. And so I had no idea who I was fighting. <laughs> no idea. I drove down there. You couldn't let Drew down, though. You couldn't nah. let him down. Who cares? Let's get it. And I get down there. I'm looking around the room. And I'm like, who in the fucking Tucson would fight me down here? And I'm like, looking around. And back then, they, those same day fights. So, like, they would get all the dudes in the room. And they would call you. Like, they way before it, they would say, hey, this guy, that guy. And you stand up. And sometimes that's the first time you've seen your opponent, you know. And they go, Seth Pazinski. And I stood up and I, I see Eddie Jarrett's Mandy stand up. And I'm like, oh, I don't know why I didn't think of him. Because he's a big dude. He's like 6'5". Yeah. Long reach. Um, Another heavy guy, fight. too. You're, you're fighting heavier opponents at lower weight class. Yeah. Like he, you're, was, you're... he was good. Um, he was definitely some. And I remember the first thing I, I saw when I got like face to face with him is how long his arms were. Like his arms were so long. I was like, man, he's he's big. He's bigger than you think, you know. Some guys don't look as big as they are, and you get next to him and you're like, whoa. Uh he I remember he threw a hook early and I, I backed up and I thought I was way out. Boom. And it I thought I was <laughs> way out. It clipped me and I ended up choked. I ended up choking him out pretty quick, but I always thought it was funny, like how Drew that was the, the most bizarre phone call for a fight I've ever gotten in my life. <laughs> Look, he fought the Stoos killer, oh. Jeff Horlocker. How did everyone else get that fight? I'm still mad about that. My whole team. Everyone on my team got that fight except me. Everyone <laughs> beat him on your team. I, was, I used to bitch about that a lot. Like, hey, what? Everyone's like, we got someone's fight. And I'm like, well, can we get the, dude, the Stoos killer there? <laughs> like, mm -hmm. like, I'll be there cornering you. I'll bring my medicals. Like, we... We, hey, we used I we used to take our medicals, mouthpiece, and cup to every fight, straight up. And I I I would I don't know how many times I've seen dudes close to my weight be like, oh man, I trained so hard for this, like putting a big show on when they didn't get the fight. I'd be like, hey, here's my medicals and shit. I'll fight you. And, now you well, need to train for that. <laughs> yeah, well, we we don't know who you are. And I'm like, yeah, cool, dog. I was just letting you know I'm here, just in case you want to get it in. We used to we used to call guys like you the JICs, the just in cases. Like these guys will fight anyone, anywhere. Is they're here? You, you know what? I would always give like a twenty five dollars just to show up. I need you here, free ticket. You and your old lady. And if I use you, I use you. You know, if not, dude, I got a couple drinks. You train. Look, my record wasn't perfect. You know, if I had a nine to no record, I might not have been like that. But at my record, it's more just like, all right, well, how many can I get in? You know, <laughs> I get, you know, it's like people are going to people if shows are going to bring me on because they like the way I fight. And that's it. It wasn't for my record. And they were going to bring me in for their guys to beat. That was clear. Like I wasn't getting plane tickets to fight guys that I was going to smash. And it was rare. Well, I think they always brought you in as the B side. Were you a ticket seller? Um. <laughs> You know, I sold a lot of tickets, but I never really like what the I think the first set of tickets or something I sold like there was some 
oh, well, you'll get percentage tickets. And then it was like, well, however many tickets you sell, will you get, they got to buy them online. And I'm like, well, just keep, like, give me hard copy tickets. Um, Cause that was the only way I would sell tickets. Cause then, yeah. then, then I would know exactly how many I sold. Um, so it, it was just the promotions that we had, like I, I, I'd sell a decent amount. Never, never like uh, there was never shows consistent enough out here to really do that. You know? Okay. The okay. shows that so I did, the shows that I did fight in, I'd sell some, sell some tickets though. That's cool. That's cool. You fought on war. That helps. That helps with the poets, yeah. especially on the indie, indie grind. If you're a big mm. ticket seller, they're looking out for you. If you're not, they're trying to get you killed. Or, or if he's rolling to hair, he just doesn't care. That's <laughs> right. Warriors <laughs> collide. You fought down the least. Uh, an, a, a fellow IFL veteran. Um, he's 10 and 5. You're 8 and 7 at the time. Um, you know, when you look at your career trajectory at this time, it's hard to pick you out of a lineup of somebody that's going to make it to the UFC, but there's, you keep leveling up. And in this fight, I mean, obviously you, you, you lose, you know, to an Anaconda choke, but at some point you find a different gear. That, that was a big learning moment for me too. I remember my homie Joe Leva, cause he would always say things like, he would always tell me, you know, you got to do this. Like he would always try to lead me. And in looking back, I think he was trying to not have me say, make the same mistakes he did, like party. And he was always trying to get me to be, be clean and told me I had a shot, you know? And it was like, it was like, never like, you can't make it. It's like, you can, like the way you fight, you got a really good style. You hit hard, you finish everybody. And He's like, you know, all the all these promoters know you got the juice, like the, you got Petro that you, you'll go out there and get it in. That's what's important is having good fights. And I remember I took that fight on short notice and I wasn't really training the way I should have been. And I, I wasn't taking time off because I was injured or nothing. I was just fucking off. And he beat me and he should have beat me that night. But that was a big eye opener for me is like, you got to train all the time. Like you got to stay in shape all the time with, with your career and all these opportunities aren't going to keep coming and you got to be in shape and ready to take advantage of them. You know, there's no such thing as luck. You're either prepared or you're not. And that, that was a big for me. Yeah. Rough house MMA had a really good reputation too. Like if you fought somebody from their gym, whether you knew them or not, you knew you were, you were fighting somebody tough and Don absolutely falls into that category. And you make a quick turnaround. You, you fight Antonio Grant. You've got Drew Fickett on the card. You also got Rico Rodriguez. Um, Chris Lytle I, I, was I'm, ringside. One more time. Chris Lytle was ringside for that. Was he really? Yeah. I remember I, I, I that was back like when you had the internet and every, nobody could get on the internet. So they would all like go, uh, you know, look up shit online or whatever. Uh -huh. And I remember going to a little community computer center and there's this guy and his wife and they were looking somebody up talking and I walked by him and it was me. Like they were looking me up on the internet. He was getting ready to fight me the next day. I didn't know much about him. I was like, I really didn't even look him up or whatever. I was just like, I was going to go fight and I'll fight with Drew. So I was happy. And I, I got him. I think it threw the first punch. I smoked him with the first punch. And yeah, I remember, I remember looking at Chris Lytle and saying, man, like you're a bit way bigger than I thought. I remember saying that to him. Like he was way bigger than I thought. Like, cause in my mind, I was like, I was the biggest 70 pounder in the world. No one ever going to touch me. And then when I got, I got. To, you were a big 70. You are a big 170 pounder. But then when I got around him, I was like, well, they don't look that small. <laughs> you know, they look a little stronger and tougher than I thought, you know? And, you know, from there, you go back to Mexico, you fight Oscar Montero, you get a, a triangle and a Puerto Pensaco at the Mexican fight. fight. What's that? I was blacked out drunk for that fight. Are you serious? Where to God. It was like my third fight for fourth fight in a row where nobody showed up. He didn't show up at the weigh-ins and that, that, that there were supposed to be some fights in between there where I would like go way in and my guy just wouldn't show up or whatever. And it, within like seven months, there was several times where guys have just like shown up and I show up and the, the guy just doesn't come. So I was like, 
pretty ticked off. All my boys, all my boys were fighting on the card. And we went over to this little pub and there was like a really good cover band. They're playing Sublime. I thought it was on the radio. I was like, damn, boys. And it was a little, I was like, oh, I'm going to get a Tecate. And I drank one and I thought, well, he might show up tomorrow. So I stopped drinking. And I went in the morning and I said, hey, is my guy here? And they said, no. I said, I'm going to come back at 1030 or whatever. And they said, no. And I went back at noon and they said, no. So I said, fuck it. He ain't coming. And I started getting hammered. And then I'm in the pool all day. Like, I didn't leave the pool. I was just drinking the pool, partying. And they come up to me and go, Seth, do you, your opponent showed up. You still want to fight? And I was like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and Drew, and Drew, go, Drew looks at me like a kid. Like, he's so, he goes, Seth, you got to believe me. I, you don't drink like I drink. You can't stop drinking or you're going to get exhausted and crash. You're awesome. That's what he said. And bro, it was a great idea. In theory. Until that gate door closed. <laughs> I'm, get, I'm getting ready to walk up the stairs. Everyone in the, everyone in the place knew I was drunk. <laughs> the people at the fight were like, well, uh, how, how many beers you had? I said, I had a few beers, bro. And he goes, well, you know, and I go, come on, man. Look, I'm from Mexico. You, get, I'm from USA. This is USA versus Mexico. Like, come on, like, let me fight. And he goes, will you sign this? And I go, oh, because I'm gonna come back and sue you guys. Yeah, sure, whatever. <laughs> We're in Mexico, so I sign it, and I'm getting ready to go in the cage. And Drew looks at me and goes, Seth, I'll take your stand up with anyone in the world, but you're drunk as fuck and your reaction time is shit. You gotta get this guy on the ground. And I was like. It's a bad deal, Seth. <laughs> what were you thinking? You know? And I got in there and I was bouncing back and forth thinking like, well, if he knocked you out, you deserve it. Because you're a fucking idiot. And I, I got lucky and submitted him pretty quick. <laughs> and went right back to the bar. <laughs> you know, you got to hand it to Drew. He gave you good advice. That's what I'm saying. He's you know, the man. Under the circumstances. <laughs> Hey, he, he's a guy you always want there because no matter what happens, he's just going to deal with the problem. He's not going to be like, oh, the problem's here. Oh, no. He's just like, oh, well, shoot. Yeah. <laughs> I know you don't like to shoot, but you got to shoot now. <laughs> you know? Yeah, don't walk a straight line. It is very the simple. will be up. Just shoot in. <laughs> I'm proud of that fight, too. It's on my pro record. I'm proud of uh, having mm -hmm. a, a dumb decision like that work out. It could have went bad, and I'm not promoting young kids to do that but <laughs> it was it was a different it was a completely different community the mma community was so different back then oh forget yeah. it. it's mexico yeah it's mexico yeah. you know yeah it's like you know you could, you could fight an actual donkey i was gonna yeah. say i was gonna say it's like they usually there's a, a, an old saying nobody ever left the fist fight to go watch the band play but they will go see the donkey show Absolutely. <laughs> so we're coming up on the Ultimate Fighter. You make the Ultimate Fighter, and you know prior to that, you fight a couple really hard guys. James Warfield, you beat with a flying knee at the uh, Phoenix, Arizona EVO, October fourth, two thousand eight. James Warfield had cannons for fists. That guy hit hard. I was supposed to fight Chad Wein Reiner on a two weeks notice, or uh, Chad Reiner, and he pulled out. And they gave me that guy. He's no I, joke. I said, whatever. Who cares? And I went out and got a win. Hey, I got to get ready for work, though, boys. Excellent. You know what, Seth? We're going to bring you back. and We're going to go through your Ultimate Fighter UFC years. We really, really appreciate your time, man. Hey, Thank you, was, guys. That was awesome, I just really, man. Thanks. Five, it's 525, and I got, I got to be working five minutes. So I got to get ready. <laughs> Okay, you, awesome think so? you guys are awesome. And Thanks, brother. Cool. Thank you, brother. Hey, have a good one. Yep. Whoa, another one in the books, Mike. Seth Bagzinski, you got to go to work, man. He bailed out on us, and uh, <laughs> I think we're just getting warmed up. But uh, another good one in the books, a lot of cool stuff. That Southwest scene is certainly wild. Man, there's so much talent that has come out of there. And, like, Joe Riggs is a wild man. Edwin Dewey's is nuts. You know, Seth Bagzinski... I mean, you just heard his story, and then there's Drew Fickett, and then hanging around in the in the wings, you know, as, as a you know beginning class fighter, you know, you've got uh, 
135, 100, future 135 pound world champion. So it's like, it's an interesting scene, man. Like, well, we're going to, we're going to keep, we're going to keep scratching. We're going to keep scratching that itch. And, you know, we're going to get as much out of, out of Arizona as we possibly can. The Lally brothers. So yeah, good. Yeah, and my my hat's good. off to Seth because uh, came, came very, uh, very honest. The whole interview through, I think it comes across. He wears his heart and his emotion on his sleeves and, and uh, it, he it fought that way too. A lot of, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and the Drew Figgins story is always, hey, we'll take more if you got him. <laughs> well, you, you got to look at it this way. His professional record before he accidentally got onto the Ultimate Fighter, it was unimpressive. Like on the surface level, if you look at it, it's just, it's, it's, it's somebody that's kind of struggling. And then, you know, in our second interview, which, you know, we'll probably get to him after the first of the year, when you see what he did on the big stage, He's got wins over Neil Magny and Matt Brown. Like he found another gear and it's somebody that isn't supposed to be where he's at, except he's fighting like higher than, than what he's supposed to. It's, it's, it's an inspiring story. It really is like his, he's got an inspiring story. Yep. I, uh, I enjoyed it. I hope you do too. Please hit like, share, subscribe, make comments, make comments on iTunes, download it on iTunes. There's so much you could do to help us out. And uh, so what are you doing? What are you waiting for? You know, come on. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Check out the full interview on iTunes, Spotify, and all major podcast platforms.